Does this mean more to the group? Um, being England versus Australia, I imagine in your career, there's games you'll remember and this will be one of them. Oh, I think you always remember World Cup games regardless of who it's against. And I don't think you can put any more importance on one game over another in terms of your, your country's rivalries or anything, particularly when there's two points on the line in, in such a tightly contested uh, table there. So it's going to be exciting. It's going to be big, no doubt. But uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's still two points up for grabs regardless of who you're playing. Haven't seen it yet. What you're kind of thinking, you're not going to re reveal your 11, I imagine, but what the discussions around selection will be, um, or what they have been, or what they will be this afternoon? Yeah, it'll be based more around what, when we see the wicket, what the, what the conditions will provide. With, I think we saw yesterday, as the game went on, uh, it started to turn a little bit more than we probably expected it to here. It, look, it looked like there was a, a little bit in it to start with, and then it dried out and sort of powered it up. Um, and, and started turning, so that, that'll, that'll be a, a case for discussion, no doubt, um, the, which, which way we go with the quicks. Uh, we've been really flexible with our group the whole way through, and, that, and that, that stems from our top order being really flexible with where they bat um, right the way through specific matchups with the ball and stuff like that. So that, that'll be the main issues um, or the main talking points of selection. Um, Aaron, as the World Cup has gone on, uh, or since you've landed in England, have, have your plans of using Mitchell Stark and Pat Cummins changed in the sense you're giving them shorter spells with a new ball, bringing them back when you need a wicket? Like, has that changed since you've come here? Uh, no, we, we always, always knew how important the middle overs will be. Uh, I think if you look at all the stats down um, oh, over the last couple of years of one-day cricket, teams that are really successful through their middle overs tend to win a lot more games just based on they're going into the back half of the innings, especially the last 15 overs with six, seven, eight wickets in hand. It, it, it's hard to stop no matter who you're playing and, and no matter what your death bowling um, options are. So um, we, we always knew coming into it that, that their middle overs will be important and, and especially uh, Starkey and Pat, um, just by their aggressiveness with the ball and their wicket-taking ability. Uh, Aaron, I'm sure you just focused on your job and winning the game for your team, but you know, the predicament that England might be in if you, if you beat them, a, a big nation, a rival potentially, how mindful are you of, of their yeah, potential predicament if you can knock them off tomorrow in terms of the semi-finals? Oh, I think if you look at England's record over the last couple of years, I, don't, I think I read something the other day that they haven't lost back-to-back -back ODIs in, in England for quite some time. So, and if you look at their trend, they, they tend to bounce back and, and go ultra-aggressive as well. So, so we're, we're ready for that. We're, we're expecting them to come out ultra-hard and, and take the game on, um, which has been one of their main traits over the last, the last couple of years in particular. So, um, yeah, we've focused more about what we're doing well and what we can improve in our game. But I think as you, as you get further into the tournament, you've seen each team play a lot of games on, in different conditions, on different surfaces, against different opposition. So it just gives you a, a bit more of an idea of how you, how you expect them to play based on, based on your matchups. Uh, Finchy, for some of the guys that are going to be here for four months or so, is there a way, is there anything being done to try and keep them mentally fresh at, for the moment and also for the long term? Yeah, the last few days and, and pretty much to our whole tournament, there's always been, if there's been a couple of training days, one of them's always been optional, um, just to make sure that the guys are, are remaining as fresh as they can because I know when you're on the road a lot and you tend to be in your hotel room, in a dressing room, or out there playing, so or in a bus travelling up and down the motorway. So, I think it's really important that guys are guys are most most guys are experienced enough to listen to their bodies and, and be able to make that call on when they when they feel they need to hit a few more balls or, or put their feet up and not even come to training. I know. Uh, I think Davey was the only one that didn't come yesterday. Uh, most most guys will have a bit of a run around in a field today, but that's about it. Uh, it's been really flexible in that regard, just to make sure guys are getting enough time away from away from a cricket ground. Aaron, no Jason Roy for England. James yep. Vince will play instead. How big a loss do you see that being for England? And can you target James Vince, who as yet hasn't got a score in this tournament? Yeah, James played really well in the warm-up game against us and got 60-odd down at Southampton. Um, he's proved to be a, a class top-order player in his own right. So you can never underestimate anyone in, in any opposition. And, and we've done our our due diligence on, on him as we have with every other player. So it'd be, it'd be really naive to overlook someone of his quality because um, you just leave yourself short and you leave yourself open to, 
to making some uh, some mistakes there. But yeah, you know, I think Jason's been a, a huge part of their planning and a huge part of their success over the last couple of years as well. So he obviously plays a, a high tempo and, and high risk game, which which when it comes off is is super 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 influential on the game. I think so. Um, but like anything, it, if you if you rush someone back from a niggle, and, and we we weigh that up all the time when guys have got niggles, if you if they, you push them a bit hard early and then they they're out for the rest of the tournament, it, it can be a, a tough decision to make. Do you sense the pressure is increasing on England with that injury and the defeat to Sri Lanka? Can you take advantage? Oh, I think the pressure is increasing on everyone. As soon as you get to the business end of the tournament, um, we've got three games left against three great sides, so. Um, the, the pressure's there on each and every individual, but also each and every team. People, teams will be pushing for that, that last couple of spots in the final four, um, whether, you're, whether you're in there at the moment or you're, you're pushing hard to, to be that side. I think the pressure's on everyone. Vinci, I know you're probably over-talking about this, but um, Johnny Bairstow's put a column out that suggested Australia hypocritical because in, at, after the 2013 Ashes, uh, Stuart Broad was encouraged to be booed, I guess, by Darren Lehman, and now Jay Earl's come out and said that, obviously, Australia don't want uh, Steve Smith and David Warner booed. Do you have a view on that? Oh, I think whatever the, whatever the public do, you, you, you're not going to change it. Whether someone comes out and says do or don't, I, I, I think it's just going to happen regardless anyway. And, and it, it hasn't affected our boys one bit, I can honestly say that. Um, if anything, it, it's given them a bit more motivation. It, it, it doesn't... As, as a player, you don't tend to hear a hell of a lot of stuff from the from the fans. You hear noise at times, but you don't hear specifics. So I'm sure that's the last thing from Steve or Davey's mind when they're walking out to bat if, if a handful of people or a whole stadium are booing him. It doesn't make any difference to, to how hard they watch the ball or how hard they doubt themselves or anything like that. It's just, I think it's a bit of white noise, to be fair. Um, Aaron, just on that... What did you make of the sort of bromance that, that sort of came to, came to pass during the IPL between Johnny Bairstow and David Warner? And, and just as an overall point, what's it, how easy is it to flick the switch back into international cricket when you're coming up against guys that you'll have got to know pretty well at domestic level? Yeah, I think that's a great thing about domestic tournaments around the world now is you get an opportunity to play with guys that you might have had per perception on just from playing against them about how they played. Um, what kind of bloke they are or something like that. So I think that's, that's opened up everyone's eyes to to 99% of people that you play with are, are good blokes, um, regardless of what, what tournament it is or who you're playing for. But it's pretty easy to, to flick back into international mode, no doubt. It's, it's a game representing your country. There's a lot of pride on the line. There's a, there's a couple of points in a World Cup, which, which is so, so tightly contested. So, um, yeah, I think a bit like, bit like anyone who plays with Davey, they, they see a, a side of him when they play against him, then they see one when they play with him, and he's... He's a great man. He's someone that obviously Johnny and him have had some run-ins on the ground too. So it's it's good to see that that when when you do get an opportunity to get to know somebody that that um, that you take that advantage. Uh, and are these guys feeding into your plans? Where, you know, say for example, Johnny Best. Will Dave Warner come to you and said, "I've spotted this about the world?" Oh, absolutely. You, you, everyone everyone's involved in sort of planning meetings and things like that. So you, you get an opportunity to talk, whether it's in a structured meeting or in a over a coffee or dinner or a beer, whatever it might be, I think you, you're all, as cricketers, we're, we're all nuffies at the end of the day for the game. So you're always, you're always um, talking about the game and, and coming up with different strategies and, and things that you've seen over time. And, and a lot of times that changes when, you, when a guy's come in as a youngster into international cricket, they, their game changes dramatically over a period of time. So, so you always have to be adapting. And, and that's what's a, a great thing about these international... Uh, sorry, the domestic T20 comps is that you, you get to play with and against so many different players that you wouldn't have had the access to in the past that that you do you do get um, you you do get to see more of them. Sam, just please keep it one question, everyone, so we can get around the room. Aaron, um, how closely are you monitoring the Aussie guys, and specifically, um, what's the feedback been from Matthew Wade? Probably not only the last week or so, but the last six months of his career. Yeah, we've been keeping an eye on the score. There's been a bit of chat between the the Jay Allen Hickey and, and myself and things like that. So it's great to see Wadey come out and, and smacking him. He's he's done that for for quite a while in, in domestic cricket now. So uh, it's great to see that they've had a couple of really good wins at the A boys. So uh, and and quite convincing as well. So that, that's that's really good. And it's a I think it's a sign of a, the strength that we're 
that we're building over the last couple of years is, is the depth of, of Australian cricket is starting to get back to what people call the heyday, the, the glory years of, of the early 2000s and times like that when, when the competition underneath the, the men's and, and women's international team was, was so fiercely um, competitive that, that it, it's starting to get back to that. Guys who are getting an opportunity, wherever it might be, they're putting their hand up and, and being, um, being counted and, and making sure that they're in the forefront of selectors' minds when, when selection comes up. Uh, you've been really good as a captain. Uh, you already won the big bash, but what was the, after becoming the international captain, was there any moment when, oh, this is difficult, I need to improve on this? And second, uh, what has been the most satisfying, happy aspect of your captaincy? Oh, there's always things that you can improve on and, and, and you look to learn. Um, for me, when I first started in leadership roles, I was quite young as a, like in all the junior representative teams and things like that. And doing it, I think, eight years ago for the Melbourne Renegades, I think from when it, to now, uh, I've, I've changed a lot. I think just in the way that I, I used to talk a lot um, and some feedback from the boys was, was don't talk so much. Um, so I took that on board and um, I, I don't tend to not talk as much around team meetings or things like that. I try, I try and let everyone else um, have, their own, have their own say and, and just contribute where I need to. Uh, and in terms of most satisfying, I think it's seeing guys come into an environment and feel really comfortable in the Australian team when they first come in. It, it can be a daunting place when you come from domestic cricket to the international, especially if it's an international tour. Um, you're away from home, you're away from your, your comfort zones. Um, so to have guys come in and be really comfortable in and around the team um, straight away, I think that's a, that's a really big positive for myself and, and the coaching staff and, and all the other senior players that contribute to, to a lot of that. So. Um, it, it's a bit more than wins and losses in a leadership role. It's about making sure that you're making sure that you're you're creating a great environment to everyone, for everyone to succeed in. I, mean, I take your point about the pressure kind of growing on every team as you get nearer and nearer to the yeah. end of the group stage. I'm sure that's absolutely right. The, the thing is, when I look back at the last 20 years or 30 years, Australia in World Cups have dealt with that pressure and then gone on to win the World Cup. I mean, yeah. and England fundamentally haven't. So, I mean, that must be a huge help, isn't it? I mean, dealing with the pressure and actually winning World Cups is part of your DNA in the way that it just isn't for England. Yeah, I think that, that over the World Cup's history, I think Australia have had that great record of peaking at the right time of the tournament. And I think when you look back to the 99 World Cup, Australia were, were on wood for, for a lot of that tournament and played their best cricket under real pressure. And, and the senior players stood up um, when it was counted. And, and I think that's a, that's a great learning for, for everyone. And, and the fact that we've got six guys in our squad who were a part of the 2015 World Cup win was, is, is really valuable. We've also got Ricky Ponding with us, Brad Haddon with us as, as coaching staff who have won World Cups and multiple World Cups as well. So just to be able to share that experience of, of what you might feel when you walk out into the middle in a, in a knockout game or a, or a high pressure game, England and Australia at Lords, it's, doesn't get doesn't get much bigger than that. It's a, it's a, going to be a great day, um, great spectacle, great to be a part of. So, I think having that experience of guys who who can almost share share what might, what you might be feeling, so you can almost be prepared for it before you before you're in that situation. I think is invaluable. Last question. Over the, the past couple of years, obviously England's one day record against Australia has been very good, yep. something like ten wins out of eleven. But you won the, the warm-up game in Southampton. Do you do you look at that and say that shows that you've turned a corner, perhaps? Uh, I think the warm-up game there was there was quite a few of England's probably first choice eleven missing. Um, Joe Root didn't play. Owen didn't play. Um, Archer didn't play. So I don't think you can say that. I, I think that we're we're going in with a lot of confidence, no doubt. We're, we've been playing some really good cricket and, and building up to to I think where where our level is um, to play really consistent international cricket in, on the big stage. And I think when you get into a situation where, where the crunch comes, it's going to be the team that holds their nerve. I think if you look at every team, you, you look down the list and, and you pick out eight or nine match winners in every team and you, then you've got guys that, that are so integral to that part that, and they make up the 11. So I, I look at our side and see a lot of match winners. I look at England, India, Pakistan, New Zealand, West Indies, like everyone has match winners and, and guys who can, on their day, blow a game apart. So it's about the team that holds their nerve the longest um, and under the highest pressure that, that will succeed, no doubt. Thanks, everyone. Cheers, guys. <laughs>